Hello there, Adam Gower here, and in today's episode of the Gower Crowd podcast, you're going to be hearing from my guest Steve Guesses, Executive Vice President and COO of Smartland, an innovative multifamily residential sponsor with offices in Miami and Cleveland. What I particularly like about Smartland's approach to value add multifamily is that they focus on B and C assets, but bring A class amenities to their offering with a focus on advanced tech. This helps them charge higher rents, develop more revenue streams, and keep tenants happier and staying longer because it becomes difficult for them to move out to units without the amenities that they get used to. Be sure to subscribe to the Gower Crowd newsletter at gowercrowd.com. It's totally free. We're the only website that focuses exclusively on the real estate crowdfunding and syndication industry, providing resources, news, and updates for both real estate syndicators raising capital and individual investors looking for places to invest their money. All that at gowercrowd.com. Just hit the subscribe button to sign up. All right, this is a great episode to listen to because Steve shares some of Smartland's secret sauce for success. So listen in and enjoy. Here he is. Steve, super good seeing you. I am so excited to learn about your next generation stuff. But before we get there, why don't you start off by telling me something about your story and background? Dr. Gower, thanks a lot. Good seeing you as well. Um, so yeah, my background, immigrated to the United States with my family from Odessa, Ukraine in 1990. Mm. So, um, you know, uh, kind of seeing some of those striking uh, resemblances from that time and today, unfortunately. But right. um, I have an undergraduate degree from uh, The Ohio State University. So really proud of that. And uh, finished my um, graduate studies in biology and uh, business from Cleveland State University. Uh, married to my amazing wife, Megan, and uh, we have three wonderful little boys. They keep us extraordinarily busy every day with uh, sports and uh, just general kid stuff. So um, yes, that's my background. And now CEO at Smartland and, um, you know, every day is amazing and, uh, you know, excited to be here today with you. Steve, you actually have a very interesting value prop uh, over there at Smartland. But what I'm interested in, let's just start off with a bit more of the background of Smartland, because now you're in multifamily value add, you're doing some ground up, I think, as well. Uh, but you didn't start in multifamily, did you? What's, what's the, uh, the story of the company? It's a very interesting pathway to where you are today. Yeah, uh, certainly. So actually, we began with uh, just one home. And uh, the idea was, uh, you know, kind of my partner, Vadim, uh, who's got an extraordinarily IT background, um, purchased one home back when the market was not doing so hot back in 08. And uh, one home turned into, you know, a management of uh, over a thousand uh, home portfolio scattered site throughout Northeast mm -hmm. Ohio. And uh, we looked to solve a problem. And initially, it was a problem of there was uh, not enough uh, management firms helping out in the area. There was a big demand, but not enough management. So we had our own management company. Um, and really, once we got through all the challenges and we got everything really dialed in, what we found is that there was still not only maybe at that time, there was a stigma in the marketplace. Now, as far as like the sexiest thing in the world. Um, and uh, but. Um, but what we found is that it was littered with a lot of challenges. And those challenges specifically was kind of all the unique components that you find within every single site. And so we sold that business in 2015 uh, with the intent and we kind of, we had already curated Smartland back in 13. And so we had the intent of uh, bringing a modern product that was all similar and the same solving these high hurdle of administrative costs, both at move outs, move-ins, tenant damages, all sorts of things that landlords deal with on a continuum that really hit the bottom line. And so we wanted to provide really good, high quality, investment quality, real estate vehicles for busy professionals, right? Passive income for busy professionals. And a lot of it had to do with 
A lot of folks didn't even know where to go, where to begin, how to start. So Smartland was a combination of our challenges that we solved from our beginning days mm -hmm. to a resolution also for our investor partners today, providing those high quality investment vehicles, passive investment vehicles for busy professionals. And so the standardization, the Ford method, we, you know, basically. Right. Is this, is what, this is what's really interesting. I remember when we first spoke, however long ago it was, you talked about the Ford method. You've just got some really efficient ways of renovating units, don't you? Just, just talk to me about the, the efficiencies that you build into. Now, though, you actually just also talk to me about the multifamily. Now you're in multifamily. We've not left housing, left housing yet. Multifamily. But you also have some very efficient systems, don't you, for upgrading and renovating these units. Tell me about that. Yeah, we certainly do. So that's absolutely correct. So we segued our life uh, from the single family marketplace into multifamily. And we took all of the vertical integrations that we had within the business, the construction, the marketing, the leasing, the IT background, and we put that into work uh, within the multifamily space. So we purchase vintage multifamily value add properties and we're very good at moving around and doing a heavy lift. So moving residents around, purchasing something that needs some deep renovation. So we're not your status quo, kind of doing the light lift, just doing corridors or lighting and signage. We're coming in and we're looking to do the whole gauntlet. And so we talked slightly about that Ford method and that's the standardization of that process, colors, types, all things being standard. So that way we're not impacting that bottom line as aggressively during tenant move outs, tenant turnovers, and we're getting a much better lifespan on the quality of the renovations. And you do, uh, you focus on um, B and C class, don't you? You prefer a kind of the, uh, the, the workforce, for want of a better term, the workforce housing level of units, right? But you bring class A, amenities into these buildings fascinating strategy talk to me about that what are, what are the what are the value add uh, components that you bring in and why do you why do you focus on b and c yeah so um so we we you know coming from a background of understanding maybe kind of what workforce housing in from being a scattered site residential property manager and now being a larger scale multifamily property manager we understand what the needs look like within um, let's say a secondary or tertiary marketplace. So you have a lot of uh, multi-generational properties that are doing great business. They've been doing a great job. However, they just simply need the right capitalization to come in and modernize it, right? So what we believe is that how we really, really stand out in the marketplace is that we come into a secondary or tertiary marketplace, we're buying one of these vintage C or D properties and we're looking to elevate it to that B or C level by modernizing it. And so by modernizing it, we're also getting a competitive advantage against our neighbors because we're doing such a capital infusion. And some of the things that we're bringing to it, those class A amenities include a lot of that tech stuff. So uh, I mentioned my partners kind of in that IT background space, not kind of, but very much so. Uh, I definitely call them, uh, uh, there's that chart where you have the early adopters, you have the, you know, kind of midway. I'm definitely somewhere in the midway and he's the guy running around with that new gadget. Um, <laughs> and so um, and so with that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring these A-class amenities, whether it's uh, Alexa's in the unit or USB outlets, the new modernized, uh, you know, uh, small items, whether it's a smart TV or uh, m many more rings, digital locks, things that are simply serving the resident way more that they're not necessarily expecting in that neighborhood. And so we're actually going to dive in a little bit about like what we're doing in regards to our new product later on, how we're going to launch that and how that is attributed to tech. But actually we bring tech in two ways. So we bring the resident side of tech and we bring the owner side of tech. And so we don't really talk a lot about the owner side of tech. In a lot of conversations so everybody wants to know hey what are these a-class amenities but right we're also bringing tech on the other side of the equation protecting the investor and trying to protect the asset and what i mean by that is that we not only implement you know the latest uh, property management solution software that that's an easy one but 
the real um, secret sauce here is going to be what we do in regards to underwriting our residents. So we use a prop tech product mm -hmm. to ensure leases on incoming residents. And so we go through an automation underwriting process for, for that. And then we ensure leases anywhere between three, six, 12 months up to 24 months. So if in, a, in an event where a resident fails to pay a month, we have an automatic button to get that month's payment. And it's all paid for by the resident. And the other market advantage mm -hmm. is that using this prop tech product, we're able to capitalize on their software platform and offer a zero deposit move-in because of that. So we are so we are building a competitive advantage on both sides, not only from the resident side, but also from the owner investor side. And that's really quite unique. And so I think alongside some other techie items that we do, whether it's the pay by phone laundry for the additional revenue or on the owner side, we also have a little bit more prop tech that we use for um, not only marketing, but also leasing and setting appointments and how our residents, our, our future residents or upcoming residents are communicated with directly in our system 24 seven, and you'd never even know you're communicating with a bot. And so we do a lot of unique stuff, yes, in the background to make the wheels turn, you know, as effectively and as efficiently as possible to really maximize that NOI. And why I'm so harping on this NOI and what we're doing on uh, building value and this and that. And it comes from a really, really great place. And here's why. So we talked a little bit about the renovation and the heavy lifting and how we're different. But really, again, you know, I'm giving out a lot of secret sauce today. You got me. <laughs> you right. you the right Don't string. worry. It's only everybody that's going to be listening. You're all right. You pulled the right string this morning, Dr. Gower. So other things that it has to do with is that in a marketplace like today, and you know, there's no reason to hide where we're at today, right? We have increased interest rates, cap rates are going up, right? However, we still have some windfalls of some upper rents and uh, we still have some windfalls of some market appreciation. There's no doubt about it. However, with such uh, you know, winds facing us, I think that it's really important to, if you are in this marketplace and you are a passive investor and you have been investing that considering somebody like a smart land who's true heavy lifter is makes a significant impact because you have to currently in this marketplace really build value you can't base it on just appreciation coming your way and low interest rates and low cap rates mm -hmm. so it can't be just from a management tactics so it has to be through a heavy lift the value add. You have to find more value in a marketplace that we're in today. But in order to find the value, you have to build the value. In order to build the value, you have to be inclined to do a heavy lift. And that's a big modernization. How much do you spend per unit, like average range, when you, do a, when you go into a, a tired uh, vintage property to get it to that, that stage, kind of maximum? NOI level that you like to aim for maximum rent level. Yeah. So, you know, typically we're doing a pretty significant increase in rents. So we're looking for a 20 to 35% increase in rents, you know, to, to gain some, a little bit of uh, what we would call cushion there. And, uh, and in order to achieve that, we're typically looking at, you know, and again, it's relative, I guess, to maybe area and, and condition of the asset at acquisition, but probably on average, Twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars a door right now in regards mm -hmm. to a uh, renovation, but that will include a full kitchen renovation with hard surfaces, stainless steel appliances. It will include a new trim and door package on the interior with new LVT flooring throughout, new window treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll have a tech package included. It'll have a new bathroom with the new tile surround and other large amenities such as the other techie stuff. I'm fascinated by the, the tech package. Just tell me what it sounds like the kind of thing you get with a car. What, what, are yeah. the, what's the, what, what is the tech package? Right. Right. Like, what, what is that? Just tell me that because it's really cool. I actually went out when we first spoke, however, again, like ages ago. I actually went out and bought a bunch of stuff. You gave me a list, actually. You know, I should put that list up yeah. on the podcast page. It was really cool. If I can dig it up, I'll, I'll put it up awesome. on the podcast page. Uh, but what is the tech package that, uh, that you're 
B and C tenants get? It's really extraordinary. Yeah, so actually, um, well, I guess we could segue a little bit into that. So we're going to be rolling out a little bit more of a um, a la carte product, I guess you can call it. So um, if you look around, you know, I guess this um, fractionalized payment thing is really taking off, right? If, anywhere you look, you can buy a burrito now for 60 cents a day. Right. So uh, I never heard of that. What's that? <laughs> like you, you, know, like, you, know, right, you know, if you go somewhere and uh, you try to buy something, you could pay two ninety nine a day or two ninety nine a month instead of paying for the whole thing at once. Right. Okay. And so now our our units, you can lease them with a tech package an a la carte tech package. And so mm -hmm. you'll be able to select um, there will be a baseline. So every unit comes with the standard product, such as the Alexa the LED Bluetooth speaker integration, the USB outlets, but you'll also be able to select uh, additional items such as a um, Wi-Fi coffee maker, a Wi-Fi microwave, a Wi-Fi connected TV or a, T a smart TV and other Wi-Fi related or Wi-Fi connected integrated components. Mm -hmm. And all of them are integrated to our new Smartland app that's gonna be rolling out for our tenant experience to be kind of complete. And so they'll be able to order things, you know, directly through Amazon Alexa and Dot, whether it's critical items or refilling other small items, whether they need a light bulb replacement or they need to order a, a maintenance order through Alexa. They'll be able to say, hey, Alexa, please put in a work order with Smartland maintenance for a light bulb replacement. And so they'll be able to do that right in their unit. And so uh, that's a really cool feature that we're building into all of our new tech package apartments and um, and so they'll be able to again choose a series of other items and in addition to that we have another a la carte product that we'll be rolling out in addition so really the idea is hey how do we stay ahead of the marketplace right with unique uh with unique uh sales products that can attract uh you know the type of resident that wants to have a more modern experience uh, and not have to pay a huge premium to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about you typically placing a few hundred people in a particular building. We're not talking about placing thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So we bring this tech package a la carte to every single resident now that uh, we're going to be interacting with. Yeah, and you see some pretty decent economics as well, don't you, from that? The cost of putting the tech package in versus uh, the amount of uh, the upside on rents. Yes, of course, and it also helps with the sales cycle. So it helps. Um, it helps with the um, purely with um, well, with com course. competition with local with uh, you know, you're competing against B and Cs that have nothing. You can, actually you're up along. I mean, these tech packages compete with the A class properties uh, in 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 your areas, don't they? I mean, they're really advanced. No doubt, and you know what? A lot of A class properties still even lack some of these technologies, mm -hmm. and so. They're so readily and marketably available and they're so consumer forward and consumer friendly that mm -hmm. it just takes a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of connecting the dots to provide an excellent service to residents. Mm -hmm. And it makes them stickier as well when they start to think about, you know, I'm going to move somewhere else. It's like they're going to look for something and nothing has all these amenities that they've really come to get used to and love. Precisely. That's definitely the segue of our intent is that we'd really love for them to be as sticky as possible. That's a great term. I love that term. I'm going to use that. And, <laughs> I want to uh, quote me every time you use it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so before we, we still do measure this, uh, this and try to quantify. And mm -hmm. so our average resident typically does spend a little bit over 24 months at our residences. And so we do take pride in that number and that number we try to, you know, make it grow as much as we can. And, and the intent there is that um, it does matter because turnovers cost money. Mm. And you also uh, now are these uh, just describe the kind of general characteristics of the kinds of buildings. Are they garden apartments? Are they walk ups? Are they sky what, what, like What's the typical what's your typical uh, portfolio asset look like? Yeah, so we have uh, mid-rise to high-rise towers, um, typically uh, two to three-story and everything to seven and 12-story towers that have, um, you know, residents that live vertically, uh, more vertically, I would say. And uh, we amenitize equally uh, those towers and we provide other 
things on exteriors to try to make their um to make their residences you know again feel like home as much as possible we've done everything from providing even uh guard rentable gardens uh as an opportunity for residents a um, rentable garden what's that so we would uh they get a basically like a small silo um and a you know a small uh two by four two by six plot uh raised garden bed that they can okay. rent the season and they can wow. You know, so the idea, you know, a lot of folks, they want to be you know, closer to nature. They want to be, they want to do some gardening. They live in a vertical tower. They should have some access to that. And so we give spaces and access for that. And so we'll do a campaign, you know, in the springtime and we'll see if residents will do a survey and see if anybody wants to do that. Oh, that's really cool. Is that, is that kind of, in England, we used to call them allotments. People had allotments. I'm not even sure whether, I think these were like council, local government owned land and you would have a little like you say it was a bit bigger than that but you know a, like a rectangle of space that was allocated to you allotted to you that's why they call yeah. it so it's, it's basically like that and we took it from there are neighborhood gardens in the area in a lot of these areas that we operate in and so we said hey we could also bring it right to the you know there's if we have enough green space on the property we could just do it right there for the residents and how much do people pay, how much rent how much you pay for rent for one of those um if i'm not mistaken i think it was 129 or 139 dollars for the season or something like that oh, cool wow um it was what an uh, interesting idea yeah and then, so, and then you also you also consolidated wi-fi didn't you tell me about that's an interesting idea rather than having all of your residents buy wi-fi or you know, internet connection through third parties. You provide it to them, don't you, as well, in some some of your buildings? Yeah, so that gets to kind of some of the tech and some of the, um, I guess it's, that tech, I guess, if uh, we drew one of those Venn diagrams, we'd be right yeah, in the yeah. center. It's both tech and resident related, but um, so yeah, that's a great question. And so what we've done is, uh, you know, we looked at our we looked at our income reports and we said, hey, look, we're getting this rebate from AT and T and it or whoever the carrier was, and it was pretty mediocre, um, maybe a few hundred bucks a month on a hundred unit tower building, mm -hmm. and uh, we said, hey, if we did a you know, what if we did a capital expenditure investment on uh, Wi Fi equipment in the tower, and uh, what we found out is that we were able to buy the um, high-end fiber optic sign direct from them through a wholesale division and so we outfitted the building with our own wi-fi equipment now we sell it back to the residents so rather than taking this mediocre you know a few hundred dollar rebate now the residents have an option to purchase it directly from smartland for 20 you know three separate packages 29.95 up to 44.95 and it's a substantial growth on noi and the really? So if we're looking at, you know, dollars spent versus dollars captured, you know, maybe a $60,000, $70,000 Wi-Fi system um, may capture an NOI, you know, value of, uh, uh, let's say, I don't know, three or $400,000 on return on investment. Really? Um, so, yeah. And uh, the same thing applies kind of for some of the laundry you mentioned, uh, some other things that we do. So what we do is we typically will remove the laundry management companies that you'll find all across the country uh, operate. And the same thing, those contracts are pretty loose. And uh, a lot of times the revenue that you're getting from it is fractional. And in some cases, you're not getting it all in some in some months because the contracts have a, a vertical ceiling and if or a ceiling. And if you don't hit the ceiling, then there's no splits and, and it gets kind of complicated. So what we've been doing is we've been replacing all the laundry systems with uh, pay by phone. And so residents are able to simply walk up to the laundry machine with their phone in hand, scan a QR code right on site. They upload uh, all their money to, the, to their app. And so they use the app, they pay by phone. They are actually cell connected to the phone. Um, so you don't need to have Wi-Fi or cell connection in your building yeah. to operate these things because they work right from the operator from the individual's phone mm -hmm. and um and then we'll do other things you know we'll if uh for example we just recently acquired a property that had carports and so we'll invest money into making the carports into garage doors installing garage doors and they'll add revenue at 40 dollars a slot at you know kind of at the on the bottom scale um and you'll see a quick kind of uh big big return on investment from small little items that uh, you know maybe some people 
uh, oversee or don't think through. And so our team is constantly working on, um, hey, what can we do to think of something creative, not only to interact with the residents, but to increase their, um, you know, kind of their life experience at the property and equally, can it have a revenue component? And so, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's important to have a balance, right? So it can't be just revenue, 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 revenue. It has to have the right balance. And, and the one thing that I can say yesterday, I was in a meeting with some local government folks and they asked me, you know, what, what is it that you can really tell us mm. that, um, why, why do you, why, why, you know, why you do what you're doing? And I said, you know, before we kind of did it, I said, uh, proving that this can be done in anywhere, right? So people that are in a secondary tertiary neighborhood should be afforded the ability to have modern apartments because there are managers and whoever that want to live and, you know, folks that hardworking folks that want to work uh, or, or live in a more modern space and they should be afforded that opportunity. And why wouldn't people give it to them? Because it takes a heavy lifter. So we said, well, we can do that. We're good at doing that. And then once we saw actually the result in the people's faces, you know, it's kind of cliche, like it, it looked like it was brighter for them, but it's not, it, it, it truly wasn't. And, and yesterday there was another amazing uh, phrase that I actually took from somebody. Uh, it was another owner operator. We were standing there and he said, you know, he goes, I call it the, um, uh, the parking lot effect. And I said, oh my God, I call it the parking lot effect. So we bought a 144 unit mid-rise property again mismanaged uh vintage you know uh needed a lot of modernizations needed the tech package needed everything right and um we brightened the hallways and uh we made the landscaping nicer and the units nicer and uh people came out and i was stopped in the uh, in a parking lot and i was told that one guy said I'm no longer embarrassed to invite my friends here. Mm. And at that time it sparked with me. And I said, you know what? This is such a big impact. It's beyond the modernization is its own thing, but you're really impacting. There's true impact here. Right. Impacts on people's lives. Right. Yeah, and th that impact was so huge just to see it. And so then we talked about that parking lot effect and mm. here's the difference. When we arrived at 144 units, there's probably 132 cars in that parking lot during the day. If you go to that property today, there's maybe 30 cars in that parking lot during the day. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. Everybody's at work. The difference is, is that people are proud to be there. They're taking pride in their lives. They're taking pride in ownership and the residences that we're providing for them. And it's making a big impact, not only for us financially, of course, but we're seeing it for the people too. And so we don't think we're necessarily doing anything that unique and equally, you know, we're not that unique. We also have problems and challenges every day, like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we try to segue that into a solution every bit of the way. And you mentioned uh, also ESG, environment, uh, what is it? Environment, what is it? And uh, uh, governance and that, uh, environment. What's the S? I've forgotten. I can't believe I've forgotten it. So, uh, well, sitting here right now, I'm going to say safety, but it's not it's right. not. Yeah. ESG. Um, <laughs> uh, environment, social. I knew it was social. It's like yes. social impact. Environment, yes. social impact and governance. That's correct. Sorry, you caught me off there. You, know, you, you caught me also at a pause. You told me, <laughs> That's all right. Neither, also, neither of us are properly caffeinated this morning. It's an interesting, it's an interesting it. concept that I know is very, very popular. It's been it recently is. heavily criticized by some very big names, Elon Musk being one of them. Yep. But I know that investors like it. I know that, uh, that uh, tenants like it. Just tell me something about what is the approach to uh, Smartland for ESG in this context? Yeah, so, you know, we're, look, we're, you heard me just a moment ago, we're all about impacting the neighborhood and making a positive impact on where we're at. And so we're doing it from every angle. So we put together all the appropriate uh, components to build the most efficient and uh, less least impactful solution, not only for residents, but also for us in our wake. And so that has everything to do with the products that we're sourcing. 
um, to the products that we're installing, to the services that we're providing. And uh, specifically, you know, it's not just LED lights and water sense fixtures. It's, you know, or rubber, you know, is it recycled flooring and uh, low VOC paints and high impact products that, uh, you know, don't really um, have that impactful left behind solution right and so elon musk is right you know he has a lot of criticism actually i i caught him criticizing um patents um patents, you know, patents the other day and um and you know i didn't mean to veer off of esg but um but he kind of made a good point of it as well in the sense of you know patents kind of stop a, uh stop folks from um also uh not creating but uh, uh uh what is the word that i'm looking for like uh, innovating innovation, innovation, innovation yeah. or gets in the way of innovation and uh there is some truth to that mm -hmm. there, there is certainly some truth to that there are probably patents do in some way segue do 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 that and so i heard that and i thought about you know, we're going to be on a podcast or I'm going to be doing something public facing or I'm going to be talking about. And I said to myself, you know, the more that we can share and educate, mm -hmm. the better we can do for everybody. Uh, and so whether that's part of an ESG initiative or not, I'm not sure. But but just in general, education, I think, is uh, and should be a big grandeur of that initiative. Yeah. And yes, the other thing is, I think there's, Hey, look, the, the reason I asked and uh, uh, specifically was because of this positive impact that you have on people's lives in general, ESG for all its different components and its, its, in, its unmeasurability at the end of the day. Uh, there, you know, there are no standards, no official standards for that. Essentially what it is, it's just a social awareness and awareness of the world around and a desire to do good for the community. Let me ask you something about investors though. Right, so about uh, individual investors who are looking at your next deal. I know you've got a deal on the, on the table right now, at least in the yeah. next few days, you've got a good deal on the table. Um, investors are clearly concerned at the moment, right? They've got rising interest rates, so the values of their homes are going down. You've got stock market that's eroded savings, and you've got inflation that's eroded savings. So how do you, how do you explain to, or how do you address those concerns that investors have? Uh, with uh, with your deals, put another way, how do you deal with downturns like the one we have at the moment? Yeah, so actually, so I think I covered a little bit of, uh, so two, that was a two part question. Um, I always <laughs> ask two parts. I just want to confuse my guests constantly. So, <laughs> so uh, we can begin with downturn. So we've been doing downturn analysis and downturn cycling analysis for quite some time. And so um, we were never, we weren't running around screaming that the sky is falling. However, there were some components or, or sticky items that maybe that were showing some of those. Well, things. you know, what's interesting about you guys is you were born in a downturn, right? I mean, you came out we of the global downturn. financial, so yes. you know exactly what they look like. Yeah. We were, we were born in a downturn. That's absolutely correct. And um, we were trying to hedge this uh, turn and thinking about it, advance of COVID. Um, so as early as, or as, you know, back to maybe mid 18 to 19, we were talking about downturn and downturn had to be part of your analysis going into 18, 19. There wasn't a lender or investor that would talk to you unless you had a downturn analysis in, in place. And all that happened is that we got paused because COVID took us back to zero on interest rates. You know things were really well we printed a lot of cash things you know were pretty rosy and so we were actually just looking at underwriting we closed a deal to this point we closed the deal march of 2020 <laughs> okay so there wasn't a lender under the blue sky closing right. deals pretty much at that time because every, nobody there was a lot high degree of uncertainty right very high degree of uncertainty and uh, look back at the underwriting on that particular deal. We were uh, looking at like a six and a half cap exit at that time. Really? And, uh, and we had underwritten it for a 6% interest um, at that time. Wow. 
and we, I'm not saying we're we were we're not it's not that we predicted something and we were great. It's not that we were triangulating our information. We we're following, trying to follow the marketplace, trying to be conservative in our approach, and thinking about you know how is it that um, you know everybody wants to hear about this downturn analysis. Things are so rosy. Let's look at it. Can we do this if it's bad? And what will it take to do it if it's bad? Right. So number one. Can the residents still qualify and pay for rents? Is our uplift, you know, reasonable that we're still within a affordable housing per se marketplace? Sure. Uh, price per rent, yes. And then number two is that worst case scenario, all else fails, you open the floodgates and it's all Section 8 residents. There's a plethora of, you know, guaranteed government rents that can come in almost instantly overnight. It's not a matter of we don't, it's not that we qualify or don't qualify them or accept them or don't accept them or like them or don't like them. Simply our business model is market rate rents. Mm -hmm. And so we don't do the voucher program classically. However, if that you know all else fails, you could you know qualify you back out. into that and, and you can cover your cover your net. Yeah. And then you know, and the intent is uh, right, you have to hold the ship and uh, if it gets really, really bad. But uh, we're underwriting. So right now, what we're looking at is that, uh, you know, as the market changes and shifts, so does our discipline of underwriting. Mm -hmm. And so as the discipline of underwriting shifts, so do the basis for purchasing cost per door changes, right? Mm -hmm. What we can pay, what we're willing to pay, we still have to do the full heavy value add. And in mm -hmm. this marketplace, you must do the heavy value add to gain that extra advantage, to gain that market, you know, additional rent bump. And so when we're looking at higher interest rates, we're simply underwriting for a higher, slightly higher exit cap in the future. Uh, we're underwriting simply for a little bit higher um, exit interest rate in the future. We're trying to buy it for a little bit less today. Mm -hmm. We're still doing the same capital infusions that we were doing yesterday mm -hmm. and tomorrow. So we're still doing that today. Um, so that's who we are. We do the heavy value add. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, um, Besides all those things, we have the prop tech items that also underpin and underwrite our leases that are going into the uh, residence, right. right? Property. So that's a unique proponent that and a component that we're using for this downturn kind of consideration. So this is not like an overnight thing. We have been working on this steadily for 18 months now to launch it at full scale across the board. Mm -hmm. So now it's at full launch and at full scale. And so you know, this wasn't overnight. And then, um, and then there were some other uh, quality items that, you know, additional NOI drivers that will help underpin the uh, incoming or looming slight downturn. However, at the same time, you know, landlords are seeing that uh, people are getting a little bit more at the register in paychecks. And so there is still this, um, you know, gap of uh, rent capture that can exist. And so even in this inflationary marketplace, you know, real estate, heavy value add is the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate curve. I think. Good hedge. Right. So let me ask actually on that note and uh, let's start wrapping up. You know, I've got three rapid fire questions, but before we move to those, let me ask you one final question. Born during a downturn, right? I mean, that was, uh, you know, an amazing time. Uh, to uh, start in commercial real estate. I mean, you really see how tough it can be. And it gives you an appreciation for how tough it can get. And it helps to prepare you, right, for, for, the, for the downturns going forward. Absolutely. But, but are you seeing, what kind of opportunities are you seeing? Are you seeing any distressed opportunities or other kinds of opportunities as, as we move in through the, the end of the year and into 23? Um, we're definitely seeing a little bit higher tick uptick in uh available assets however still mm -hmm. what we're seeing is that um unfortunately what we're seeing is that the seller um uh, let's say seller expectations haven't yet met the market expectations mm -hmm. and so it's still you know you still have to be pretty selective and very disciplined and uh, and really carve out the uh true jewel or, or real high value add product and so for us it's still maintaining that same uh lockstep program that we implement mm -hmm. and uh if we look back even you know it looked like q2 um there's a little bit less activity in regards to uh units coming online for sale and i think it was because 
after Q1 transitioning into Q3, Q1, you know, folks were kind of getting their properties ready. They still had really low interest rates. I mean, we were still at, you know, zero. And um, the Q2, it kind of hit you really hard a little bit. And then, um, so seller expectations got rattled. And so we're seeing a little bit of a stabilization of that now where, you know, the basis on per door is coming back down. And so we're looking at this from, you know, two ways. We have a, um, we have a open fund where we're, where we're targeting the same asset classes. And then we have direct investments available as they come um, online. So we're preparing for both and coming, you know, being born out of that downturn. Right. You know, we know that uh, being cash liquid is going to be an uh, advantage for us, for sure. Steve, let me ask you three final sign-off questions. First one, what are your daily habits that make, keep you successful and productive? Um, getting up before the sun gets up, mm -hmm. uh, having a real discipline and organization skills, uh, being disciplined about my calendar and, uh, trying to, you know, have as much control of it as you can. And, uh, and most importantly, try to make it home for dinner, uh, for family dinner every day. Oh, good for you. All right. So here's an interesting question. What's been the hardest lesson you've learned in real estate? Um, nothing is static. Um, in real estate, um, it's a move, it's a moving target. And so, um, you have to constantly, um, uh, maneuver and change and, uh, accommodate your systems to the most modern, uh, times and, uh, make sure that you're not only keeping up with the times, but trying to get ahead of the times from, uh, both, uh, owners, owner perspective and, uh, resident perspective. And my last question, I just, I'm going to adjust it slightly. I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Uh, rather than just what advice do you give to an individual investor thinking of investing in real estate for the first time, what do you what advice do you give to an individual investor who's not invested in real estate, who is concerned about the economy and and worried that uh, you know they've lost a lot of money in inflation and you know generally concerned and and not sure how to protect their own future? What's your advice for that? So hard assets, things that you can hug, touch, and love you know, visit, um, you get, you gain the most insight and control metrics over, right? So you can be in the driver's seat, you can maneuver that thing uh, versus stocks and bonds. You kind of at the whimsical nature of how the marketplace and the news is going to react. And so if you haven't invested in real estate uh, now, just like any other time is a great time to start. Uh, not starting is, uh, you know, is the wrong activity. Uh, and purely from a, uh, uh, purely from a diversification, uh, real estate assets, this, uh, you know, this asset class is, uh, if you're here watching this and you're, you're halfway through the process, you're educating yourself, you're doing all the right steps. The next step is just pulling that trigger and, and seeing that this could truly be a passive activity that builds real wealth and not only can build wealth, but if you find the right deals, it could be some generational wealth in there. It could be a lot of tax deductions that you're not even considering. I have a lot of busy professional friends that are doctors or lawyers or CPAs. Well, so the CPAs, they kind of know a little bit better. But, <laughs> also, uh, anyway, yeah. but still, you know, they, they need access to good investment real estate, passive real estate. Steve Gassis, you are CEO. Are you at Smartland? What's your title? Oh, CEO. CEO. CEO, yep. Yep, I'm partner of uh, Smartland. An enormous pleasure, real pleasure seeing you today. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. Have a great day. That was Steve Gesses, Executive Vice President and COO at Smartland. Be sure to subscribe to the Gower Crowd newsletter at gowercrowd.com. It's totally free. And we're the only resource that focuses exclusively on the real estate crowdfunding and syndication industry providing news and updates for syndicators raising capital and investors looking for places to invest their money. All there at gowercrowd.com. Just hit the subscribe button to sign up. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for listening. And thank you, Steve. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Steve Guest is Executive Vice President and COO at Smartland. Best of luck to you with the current raise. It looks like a really interesting offering. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us today. It's always 
A delight to have you here. And I hope you found today's episode as interesting as I did. That's all for today. And for this episode, I'll see you next time. And for now, this is Adam Gower signing off. Thank you.